All right, for those of you who have watched my previous videos, you will know that according to Jonathan Wells in a book entitled Icons of Evolution, modern day biology textbooks have used a series of embryo drawings called Heckel's embryos to illustrate evidence for evolution, illustrate how human beings, fish, monkeys, all these different creatures are very, very similar early on in their development and differences arise only later. Now, Jonathan Wells is an embryologist and according to him, the, these pictures that we see in the textbooks are actually false. Um, that this is not accurate information that's being given to students as evidence for evolution. And of course, as you can imagine, Jonathan Wells as a PhD in cell biology and um, embryology, and he's a critic of Darwin. Now, on the other hand, uh, the National Center for Science Education, or the NCSE, as their acronym would have them be. Um, on the other side, the National Center for Science Education has claimed that Jonathan Wells is a liar, that the embryo drawings that he claims are have been included in modern day textbooks are simply not there. Um, the, it's a, the entire story is something that he fabricated himself. So in this video, I'm going. what I decided to do, as I promised in my two previous videos um, leading up to this, is I told you that I would order textbooks and I would find out for sure in front of the viewers if these textbooks actually contain these alleged hoax embryos from the 1860s um, and so you're going to be able to take a look with me and find out for sure who is telling the truth and who um, who's lying to the public about who took the cookies out of the cookie jar. So uh, let's check it out. So this is Biology Discovering Life, second edition by Miller and Levine, and yes, that's Ken Miller. What happens when we look inside? Oh, hey, those look an awful lot like something I've seen before. The early embryos of humans and other vertebrates look so similar that it takes an expert to tell them apart. During the earliest stages of development, all these embryos have gill pouches and a tail, remnants of structures needed by our aquatic ancestors. And when we go down here, we see data supporting the fact of evolutionary change, and so it goes through and talks a little bit about that. And then one of the examples is similarities in anatomy and development, just like that picture you just saw up there. Darwin and his contemporaries knew that early embryos of many animals look nearly identical and that the earliest stages of development in lower animals seem to be replaced in the early development of higher animals such as ourselves, figure 8.15, which is what we just saw. Darwin realized that the similar developmental paths followed by animal embryos makes sense if all of us evolved long ago from common ancestors through a lengthy series of evolutionary changes. These striking embryological similarities led some of Darwin's contemporaries, although apparently not Darwin himself, to believe that the embryological development of an individual repeats its species evolutionary history. Why then should the embryos of related organisms retain similar features when adults of their species look quite different? The cells and tissues of the earliest embryological stages of any organism are like the bottom levels in a house of cards. The final form of the organism is built upon them, and even a small change in their characteristics can result in disaster later. It would hardly be adaptive for a bird to grow a longer beak, for example, if it lost its tongue in the process. The earliest stages of the embryo's life, therefore, are essentially locked in, whereas cells and tissues that are produced later can change more freely without harming the organism. As species with common ancestors evolve over time, divergent sets of successful evolutionary changes accumulate as development proceeds, but early embryos stick more closely to their original appearance. All right, now, now that all that's covered, let's take a look at this. Okay, so we like, once again see a picture of the textbook's drawing of embryos, figure 8.15, and these are Heckel's embryos. Um, no, take a look at Heckel's embryos next to 
photographs of the real thing. And now, one more time, let's take a look at the textbook again. So here's the textbook's pictures of the embryos, and here's Heckel's pictures of the embryos. Once again, here's the textbook's pictures of the embryos. Clearly, uh, Heckel's embryos are being used in, or were being used in, Miller's textbooks during the 1990s. So, um, NCSC doesn't have much ground to stand on here. All right, so now we see Biology 6th Edition by Raven and Johnson. We open up, we see the same embryo drawings as before, only these are rearranged uh, so they're flipped. Uh, so they're not horizontal anymore, now they're more vertical. Figure 60.18 reads, Embryonic development of vertebrates. Notice that the early embryonic stages of these vertebrates bear a striking resemblance to each other, even though the individuals are from different classes, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. All vertebrates start out with an enlarged head region, gill slits, and a tail, regardless of whether these characteristics are retained in the adults. Okay, so this is an interesting one. Alright, so what do we see when we look around here? We see embryonic development in vertebrate evolution, we see ontogeny recapitulates, recapitulates phylogeny, and of course I've read all this, and basically what we're seeing here is the claim that this is evidence for evolution, uh, contrary to what the NCSC would have us believe. Now what's this quote say? Vertebrates seem to have evolved largely by the addition of new instructions to the developmental program. Development of a mammal thus proceeds through a series of stages, and the earlier stages are unchanged from those that occur in the development of more primitive vertebrates. All right, now here's the summary of what this section was about. I mean, clearly, Heckel's embryos are being used here as evidence for evolution when the NCSC claimed that this never happened. Um, now, when we go on to the next page, we don't really see a lot of the same thing. It kind of moves on to still talking about embryology, but on a different subject. Um, so, as we can see, Heckel's embryos were clearly being used in this textbook as evidence for evolution. I mean, the NCSC can have their beliefs, but they are not entitled to their own facts. Here's Heckel's embryos, um, and of course, you just saw them compared to the actual textbooks. The textbook was opened, and you saw Heckel's embryos compared to the textbook. Now, here they are side by side, with Heckel's embryos, of course, rearranged so that they're vertical, uh, like the Raven and Johnson pictures, and here they are. Um, overlapped. I mean, there's not any wiggle room here. There's really no room, f there's no room for debate at all, period. I mean, these are just redrawn versions of Heckel's embryos, and they look nothing like reality. Uh, and it kind of disturbs me, how does this keep, how did this go on for so long in schools, and nobody, it seemed like nobody seemed to notice. I mean, it kind of went under the table. I mean, a few people noticed, but nobody was really doing much about it um, until Wells came along. Um, I mean, look at this picture. Clearly these are Heckel's embryos, uh, and I want to thank the Discovery Institute for uh, putting together these pictures. And of course, you can say, well, I don't like the Discovery Institute. They're an intelligent design advocacy group. Uh, well, guess what? They're scientists. They put forth their theory, and just because you don't like their theory doesn't mean their facts are inaccurate. It's on you to prove that their facts are wrong. And right here, clearly what we have is Heckel's embryos overlapping Raven and Johnson, and the two are literally one and the same. So anyway, let's move on to the next textbook. All right, this is Biology by Burton and Gutman. And I'm not quite sure exactly which edition this is. I know it was copyright 1999. Um, however, when I look through here, I couldn't find a edition number or anything like that. But this is another high school biology textbook, as you can see. And when we open up to the embryo pictures, what do we see? Oh, hey, look at those. Um, yeah, uh, hey, look at that. I've, I've never seen those pictures before. Um, and what is this little word here above that? Eva, Eva. Ah, oh, okay. Maybe, maybe it'll come in more clearly here. Oh, this is, it's, 
see, maybe I need to put on my reading glasses. Oh, evolution. Okay, okay. So this is evidence for evolution. All right, I understand now. As some 19th century zoologists compared the anatomy of animals with the anatomy of their embryos, they rallied under a model that became a cliché of biology. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. By this, they meant that during an animal's development ontogeny, it repeats, recapitulates the structure of its ancestors, phylogeny. A mammal, for instance, evolved from a reptilian ancestor, which evolved from an amphibian, which evolved from a fish. So, according to this viewpoint, the early mammalian embryo looks like a fish, and then successfully looks like an amphibian, a reptile, and finally, a more generalized mammal. This picture is only partly true, but it is true enough to be useful in thinking about both ontogeny and phylogeny. As a mammal develops, it first looks like a fish embryo, then like an amphibian embryo, then like a reptile embryo, see illustration, it makes sense that an organism should develop in this way, since amphibians evolve by modification of fish anatomy. The developmental program in their genomes begins with instructions to develop into a fish-like form, but then the program changes to make them into amphibians. Similarly, reptiles which evolve from amphibians carry developmental programs that make their embryos like those of amphibians up to a point and then change into the pathway that makes them reptiles. In other words, every evolutionary change is built upon a developmental history, and this is why embryonic stages show the progression we see. This view of development lies behind looking at larvae for clues to ancestors. This is what makes us think that the planula larva of Nidarians, for example, must resemble the Nidarian ancestor. Well, that was a mouthful. Let's take a look at these pictures one more time. Of course, according to the National Center for Science Education, Heckel's embryos, which you can clearly see here, have never been used as evolu evidence for evolution in modern day textbooks. Um, yet here they are being used as evidence revolution in this modern day high school biology textbook. Um, now of course this was made in this textbook was from the 90s and Jonathan Wells wrote um, in about the year 2000 so this is all this was current when Jonathan Wells is writing so they're claiming that Jonathan Wells lied and that these embryos that you see before you were never in modern day textbooks is simply uh, simply not true. I mean clearly they're there. You can see them very clearly for yourself. I didn't make these textbooks up myself. I didn't I didn't pull out my box of crayons and draw these pictures myself and stick them into a textbook. The higher ups in the creationist conspiracy just I mean they just don't quite pay me enough for that. I mean I only get a couple billion dollars a year, not much more than that. Now perhaps I'm being unfair here. I mean after all these are just high school biology textbooks, which is what Wells was talking about. Um, as the National Science National Center for Science Education has pointed out, um, apparently Heckel's embryos were never used by professional evolutionary biologists as evidence for evolution. I mean, they knew better, um, you know. So hey, Heckel's embryos have never been used by evolutionary biologists as evidence for evolution. Or have they? Uh, let's take a look at another biology textbook, and this one's going to be a college-level biology textbook, not a high school biology textbook. Um, this is for students who want to take a class in evolutionary biology. Uh, let's take a look. All right, this is Evolutionary Biology by Futuma, and this is the third edition. Again, this is from the 1990s. And what happens when we open up and look inside? Oh, well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. There's Heckel's embryos right there, clear as day, and it's under development and evolution. Now, this chapter was, this passage was way, way, way in depth, so, I mean, there was just a lot to read here, way too much for one video. Um, if you're, you want to see all of what was written, you can, um, 
check it out from the library or something like that. But let's take a look right here at the figure. An illustration of Von Baer's Law. Three stages in the development of several vertebrates. All the vertebrate classes share many common features early in development. Many distinguishing features of the classes and orders appear later. From Romains, 1901. And of course, when you take a look at the rest of this college biology textbook, you see the same thing. I mean, this is under a chapter that was chapter 23, Development and Evolution. And we see approaches to studying development and evolution. We see ontogeny and phylogeny. We see developmental principles of evolutionary change. Um, bottom line, Heckel's embryos, even by professional evolutionary biologists, was being used as evidence for evolution. Now, uh, this brings us to another important point. Why is it that the folks at the National Center for Science Education felt the need to tell the public and tell the world that Jonathan Wells is lying, that Heckel's embryos have never been widely used in modern day textbooks when they most clearly have been if you actually look up the textbooks? And according to the National Center for Science Education in the article that I cited in my previous videos, Jonathan Wells is basically a bold-faced liar, that Heckel's embryos have never been used in modern biology textbooks, either high school or college. Um, they've never been used as evidence for evolution in these textbooks. Um, they've never been used as actual biology. They've never... Um, basically, the everything that Wells is saying is just complete nonsense. Why do they feel the need to say this? Why do they feel the need to claim that these pictures weren't in the textbooks when they clearly were, and when they were clearly being used as evidence for evolution? I mean, it really, really should raise a lot of questions, and it should, for those of you who are biology educators, for those of you who are skeptics of Christianity, for those, even of those of you who are hostile, completely hostile to intelligent design, completely hostile to creationism, completely hostile to Christianity, Islam, religion, period, all of this. I don't, I don't care if you are the most diehard secular humanist in the world. It should really bother people that the National Center for Science Education is trying to rewrite history. I mean, trying to claim that these pictures were never in the biology textbooks when Gould, Wells, and Richardson are all saying that yes they were there and I just pulled, I just made a video where I pulled up the textbooks, opened them up, and showed you those pictures so that you could see them for yourself. I mean I didn't pull out my crayons and make up these textbooks myself people. If this is the case, if this is the type of historical revisionism, this uh, that the NCSC is doing, then, I mean, that kind of makes me wonder, what is their agenda? I mean, because it's clearly not to help science education. It's clearly not to help people find the truth. It's, they've clearly got an agenda, and, I mean, whatever it is, if it has to be based on lies, then that makes me really think that their agenda can't be good. Um... I mean, I, I don't think that the ends justify the means. I mean, this is this is scary here. I mean, and people are buying this stuff. And now those of you who are evolutionists, you know, I respect that. Um, I respect that not everybody is where I'm at right now. Um, I respect that we have a lot of different thought in the world. And I, I mean, some of you who will see this are probably my peers or even my mentors. Um, but the fact of the matter is, the National Center for Science Education is saying things that they know not to be true. I mean, there is no way that they think, there is no way that they believe what they said. They claimed that every single book that Jonathan Wells reviewed did not have Heckel's embryos in it. So they implied that they went and looked inside the books, saw that they weren't there, and walked away. However, if you've watched this video and you saw what I have, what I posted, that's impossible. Um, so, for those of you out there who obviously believe in creation, please, you know, be educated. Um, understand evolution, because I don't think there's any greater harm to the creation movement 
or to the intelligent design movement, both of them, than people who don't understand evolution and are trying to argue against it. For those of you who are evolutionists, uh, who think that it's a waste of your time to investigate creation, um, a lot of you will say, well, um, I've seen the evidence and I know that creation can't be true. Consider the possibility that throughout the history of science, a lot of times radical paradigm shifts have not been based on, well, here's this brave new ton of evidence that nobody's ever heard before. A lot of times it's the same evidence, but a different perspective. Um, a lot of you have been lied to about what creation and intelligent design actually say. Uh, for example, neither creationists nor intelligent design advocates deny natural selection. Neither of them deny beneficial mutations. Um, a lot of what you've been taught about evolution, a lot of what you've kind of heard in school maybe, um, even those of you who are PhD scientists, um, consider that there's another side to things. Consider that there are thousands of scientists out there advocating for young earth creation or advocating for intelligent design. Um, they might be a minority, but everybody knows the history of science, in the history of science, truth has never been determined based on who's the minority and who's the majority. Um, and this is not an issue that's been settled. Um, like I said, a lot of what you've probably been told about creationists and what creation actually is, what intelligent design actually is, you know, either of those two things. A lot of what you've been told about them by the media, um, probably through the grapevine, isn't true. And there are those with a religious motive to suppress creation science, to suppress intelligent design. Um, a lot of you have, and you know, it's no different than potentially a religious motive from a so-called Christian organization or a so-called Islamic organization that might try to silence science. Um, in the same way, there are those who have a secular agenda out there, who have more of a secular religion, they might be more humanist, and they have an agenda to silence anybody who disagrees with evolution. And if you look into it more, um, the National Center for Science Education has actually been responsible for making sure that scientists fired simply for not agreeing with evolution, simply for questioning evolution. And honestly, if evolutionary theory is something that needs to be protected like an endangered species, then that kind of makes us wonder how fit it actually is to survive when competition is around. Um, thank you for everyone for your time. Uh, thank you for watching this video. And I apologize for my humor, which I'm sure is quite dry at times. Um, anyway, thank you very much, and may science prevail. Uh, this is Greg, out.